give a little background on the title itself. Um, the Intangible and the Imaginary comes from an essay written by Baudelaire in the time when photography was just becoming um, sort of an art form in itself. And he posited in this essay that uh, photography, unlike painting, could never express the intangible and the imaginary. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to begin by asking you all about your relationship with painting and how you came to work in that medium. So if you'd like to begin, Mateo? Sure. Check, check. <laughs> Um, my relationship with painting. I, uh, when I was a kid, I was a, I guess, I was in a family with artists. That sounds kind of cliche, I guess, for Native people to say. But uh, I was in a, a multi-generational family of artists. I didn't really realize that until, um, until I was old, much older. But that actually came out of a, a kind of intergenerational legacy of, um, Coach T polychrome artists and mono storyteller makers. My father was a Dunn School um, painter. He studied at the Santa Fe Indian School. Uh, he was contemporaries with Bach Chali. And um, I, you know, I guess my, my brother and myself, I just grew up around artists. Like everyone just made art. So it wasn't really a conscious thing. Maybe if I'd been in a family with people who are doctors and lawyers, I would have gotten to that. But, I was just surrounded by people who made art. Um, one of the things that, that's kind of carried through my life as a kind of thesis idea is that I'm a part of a, a, a kind of family of people that use their hands to make things. Um, so that's, I guess, kind of the, the origin of my, my relationship to, to, to drawing and painting. Um, that's kind of the beginning of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's funny because I can totally defend painting forever. I got a million answers, but why I paint is a really good question that I don't have an answer for. I mean, I paint. I have three degrees, college degrees, and they're all in painting, but uh, I just do. I've done other stuff, but I keep returning to painting, so I'll answer other questions. <laughs> I, and I also I don't have a very sophisticated answer except that it's just another tool for me to um, uh, you know express whatever it is that I'm trying to express creatively um, and I don't feel entirely bound by painting so I can't say that it's my sole medium um, but it's I guess in, in that context that it's just a, another tool that I would utilize in my practice Uh, painting, why I paint. I think why I paint, it's always been natural to me. Um, as a little kid, I was just always drawing and coloring, and I really uh, kind of, my parents really embraced it. So I loved to draw, you know, in my little, I had a little art room set up, and I would give my paintings to my parents, and they were always so thrilled to have that, that work of art for me, and it really kind of like brought that. Um, brought it to life for me, and I think that's just always carried through in, in all the artwork that I do, is to, to, have, to get that satisfaction you know, out of somebody, to, to connect with somebody else, um, so that's why I think. Great, thank you all for answering. Um, so, the way I think about painting is it kind of balances between both tradition and innovation. On the one hand, you know, you have da Vinci and you have Giotto and painting can be very traditional and sort of bound by traditional rules of expression like, you know, perspective and color theory. But at the same time, you have Jackson Pollock and you have Dolly and painting has been really picked up by all kinds of avant-garde movements. So with that in mind, I'd just love to hear about how you manage the influence of both past tradition and present innovation in your work. If you work solely based on tradition or if you try to defy tradition and go more with innovation, combining them, etc. So 
Say it again. <laughs> well, what's the question? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. The question was, um, how, how do you think about your painting practice? Do you think about tradition and do you, do you really try to stick to traditional painting methods or are you more into abstraction? Are you more into surrealism? Or do you combine them? I, you know, for myself, the work I do is, um, so it's really, a lot of it's photographic. So, to start with, um, there's kind of a whole discourse about photography and painting, and it's kind of like this, uh, this existential question about the end of painting, and you know, does, does painting exist after photography, and people struggle with that. It's kind of like the Fritz Scholder question, like, about being a native painter, or like a, a painter, or are you an Indian? Uh, you know, for myself, I use photographs a lot. I use my own photographs a lot. And, I, and they're kind of, you know, if I was just going to describe them briefly, I would say it's kind of like a collision between the photographs and a kind of abstract expressionist paint handling. So they're very nostalgic, right? I mean, it's very, the kind of painting style I have is very, like, 1960 New York backgrounds with little pop images of native people in them. Usually they're actually portraits of people that are still around. So, um, I don't know if that really answers that, but that's just kind of my, my direction or my take on it. I also do painting, which doesn't have photography in it, so I do easel painting, train in both. But increasingly, I, I wind up doing so. I guess mixed media is kind of my signature style on painting. Yeah, I looked it up. Uh, Paul de la Roche is the person back in the early 1800s when he saw daguerreotypes. He's like, painting's dead! But I mean, we know photography has evolved and changed painting so much. The fact that things will be cropped off in a certain way, instead of having a whole figure that's a photographic technique. The fact that now we can see things through photographs that we can't see with our naked eye, like a bullet going through you know, a piece of fruit, all that. Raindrops, that we can now incorporate that. So I think uh, photography has freed painting up. And one interesting thing about painting, because I went to San Francisco Art Institute for my grad school. It's the one program in the entire United States that has no, they're really proud of this, I could care less. Uh, they have no applied arts. They have no graphic arts. They have no commercial arts. They are theory, theory, theory. And I would actually have a classmate say, why would anyone go to grad school for painting? Like, that's what dumb people do. But, um, and I've thought long and hard about this. It's like, I do not know any other way that you have a larger range of colors than anything else. Like even printmaking, maybe, you know, because you can still use any pigment. But in painting, you can use dyes, you can use pigments, you can use different effects, uh, translucent effects, encaustic. The oldest form of painting is translucent, so you can build layer and layer. You can have these different colors reflect off each other. Meanwhile, the camera is an amazing tool. I love photography, I use it every day, but uh, the camera eye cannot see as many greens in particular as a human eye can. I mean, you probably notice that if you're trying to photograph nature, like the greens just bleach out. And then any kind of commercial um, imagery on a four-color um, four printmaking, you're only using a certain range of pigments. And I know that you have a chemistry background, so I hope you'll talk about that. But like each pigment and each dye has its own, you know, because they're created from vegetables and minerals. They have their own strange, unique personalities. I mean, Green paint killed Napoleon. That's pretty powerful. But anyway. <laughs> That's true. <clears throat> okay, so I'm trying to think of your, your question and um, how my practice relates to these traditions and how it's informed by tradition and it's bound by that. And um, I would have to say that I'm, I don't, as much as I have just said that I'm not bound by the medium of painting, I also don't feel bound by those traditions because I don't come from that tradition. I mean, I feel like that was uh, a, a tradition that was born out of making separations in society. And um, so in saying that, or like a hierarchy in society, and so in saying that, um, I think intentionally I don't want to participate, participate in that, um, to create, to continue creating those divisions, to make things that are more accessible. Um, so I guess, in accordance to your question, I don't feel bound by those traditions. Um, however, I do acknowledge it. I, I think it's uh, valid to have 
um, you know, to be familiar with it and to have a practice, like, to, uh, to sort of acknowledge it, but I think that's as far as it goes for me in that, in that medicine. Jack. <laughs> okay, um, tradition and, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tradition. Traditionally, I don't come from a traditional background in painting at all. Um, like, I grew up in Santa Fe, and I kind of resented the whole Santa Fe art Indian market scene when I was growing up here. It was just like I wanted to get the hell out of Santa Fe. So uh, it really wasn't something that I embraced until I was much older. Um, I had moved to Las Vegas, Nevada, and um, I was living there for about four years, and it came to a point where I really just needed to come home and uh, sink my roots in again, and that was where I was like, oh, you know, there's this whole other, other world of art that uh, people are embracing that's there for me, um, you know, as a native artist. Uh, looking back at my paintings, it was always kind of... Um, it was always there, then I, there's almost like a native flavor that was just always kind of there um, that I feel re resembles a lot of like uh, the polychrome pottery weaving uh, design, uh, geometric design. So um, I came back to Santa Fe in 2008 and I started to attend school at the Poe Arts Center in Pueblo, Pawake. And over there, it was just like completely immersed in so many native, different native cultures that that's where I began to learn about traditional techniques um, in silversmithing and pottery. So um, that has really kind of brought the traditionalism to, into my world, but I have a, a lot of respect for it and I, I try to you know, keep, it, keep it real to me without you know, trying to co-opt anything um, that that I don't really feel uh, belongs to me or that has been shown to me in that traditional way. So, um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Well? Okay. okay, that's my answer. <laughs> Great. Well, America, I'd be interested in hearing from you and, and everyone else um, what you think about formal education and painting, being formally educated in painting um, or doing painting lessons as a kid. How does that um, how does that influence you as an artist, as an adult now? Um, I don't know. I always compared it to like I think I knew. Okay. <laughs> I always <laughs> you always get wrapped up. I compared it as like climbing the top of the mountain. I mean, it's nice to know what you and your friends and neighbors do. And I grew up around artists, and they're great. But um, I also want to know what the heck's happening in China. What's happening in Japan? You know, and why. Is it, no, not Gerhard Richter. Who's the guy who spent 40 years only painting white? Help me out. Ah, his, Reimer, Reimer. Anyway, okay, there's an artist. He spent 40 years and he only painted white and then he went only to Jessa. And it's like, I used to hate him and I'm like, if I meet this guy, I'm gonna punch him up. Then I went to school and now I actually understand what the hell he's doing and I actually kind of respect him. Like, I mean, art's complex and all these people in the art world, you know, it's like, we should study it. And we should also, everyone should study Native American art history. I mean, it's so amazing. There's so much out there. And we've only hit the tip of the iceberg of, you know, public knowledge of Native art. But anyway. Does anyone else want to speak to that? Formal education. Is that, is that Jason Garcia in the house yeah. back there? Yeah. How are you liking your formal education? Is he education? hiding back there? A fly on the wall. Put a, put a mic on Jason Garcia. How do you like your formal education? What's that? I'm sorry. Um, it's somewhat necessary to quote unquote succeed in the Western art world and things like that. So. But how's it going to help you back home? Mm. Can you carry things back to your home and share it with me? I guess maybe just my own personal experience, professional experience, academic experience of encouraging young Pueblo and native artists, native students to go back to school, to go to school, to get their education. So I think it has its place. Great. Uh, well, uh, does anyone else want to speak to maybe painting doesn't require education, that you can create art from the heart and you don't need to learn about it? 
Sure. <laughs> uh, I think, I think you, Jason, you have a very valid point, um, and I'm finding that more and more um, as I, you know, approach this career. But um, I feel like now, nowadays we have so much to empower ourselves with the internet, mostly. Um, not that it's a, it's direct contact, and you really can't beat that. But um, there's so much information out there available. I'll use this as an example. Uh, I started getting offers for work in uh, graffiti art, uh, making murals and um, and doing large scale pieces, and I had no idea how to use spray paint. And how did I learn how to do that? It was all internet. I researched the hell out of it, you know, and and then put it to use. Um, I didn't have a crew or anybody to show me that, which is kind of uh, the traditional way for graffiti artists to learn is to be become a member of a crew. Um, so I didn't have that, but the internet really, like, I, I was able to do my own research to the point where I was able to take on, um, take on these job offers now and, and get work out of it. So um, I think it's really what you make out of it, uh, you know. Uh, I think it's possible, completely possible. It's, it's not only me, I know it happens for others. Definitely. Um, so, this is a defense of painting, and I would love to hear from all of you, and I know you'll have different opinions probably. What makes painting relevant, and what makes it interesting, and what makes it innovative in the contemporary art world? Does anyone want to start? Do you want to talk about chemistry? <laughs> I don't know what the chemistry thinks. <clears throat> I don't know what's coming about us. Paintings able to exist for 40,000 years. It's archival. <laughs> <laughs> um, defense of pain. What makes it kind of relevant? And yeah. It, it's timeless. Pain is timeless. Um, if you look at, you know, Lascaux cave painting, if you look at stuff at uh, Chaco Canyon or Chetro Kettle. This kind of rock art experience, uh, it's very direct, it's very primary, um, it's very dreamlike, it's kind of universal. It happens in all cultures, of all people. That's the, the kind of essential vibration or feeling of the painting, right? For me, and I think for many people, um, it's not really different than spray painting on a wall, in essence. It's, it's kind of directly related back to that. And it's a timeless need. Um, Jerry Brody, uh, he's a guy I studied with at UNM. <clears throat> he's a pretty famous uh, Mimbris pottery author. And he said, uh, he was talking about rock art, petroglyph and pictograph rock art in the Rio Grande world. And he said that um, you know, he wasn't sure what this stuff means. He looked at the iconography and he said, some stuff I understand, some stuff I don't. But what's important to understand from a kind of art historical position is that these images on the rocks these kind of paintings and little images that have been picked out of the rock, they are what is important to the people at the time which they make them. So that's the signage of our time. You know, when you talk about some spray painting on the wall, or making a painting out of a photograph, or making a you know painting out of nothing, just pure pure color, like America's talking about, um, that's timeless. That's kind of like the human zeitgeist. That's just humanity kind of flowing over. That's the basolic pot of life that just kind of simmers over. You can't stop people from doing that. I was sitting at a um, you know, feast day with some of my relatives not too long ago, and they were just pissed off because there's graffiti everywhere, right? There's all the old, older people people were talking about you know, how fucked up it was, there was graffiti everywhere. So they're like, this is terrible, this is everywhere, we hate it. And, and I was thinking to myself, I don't have a very you know, traditional point of view about it, but I was thinking to myself, it's kind of, it's kind of remarkable, really. It's, it's unstoppable. You can't stop people from doing stuff like that. You can't stop them. People will get arrested. They'll get thrown in jail, get incarcerated. They'll get sentenced to community service. You can't make them stop doing it. So in a sense, I mean, I understand this kind of conservative public idea that you, know, you can't just go around and mark shit up. But at the same time, you have to understand it's a human vibration. It happens throughout history. It's the same essence of what we're talking about now. It's very much the same thing. You know, 